Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. So um, I was recently asked, I think about a month ago, someone was asking me about bayonets and if bayonets were ever used um, by themselves. Now I have spoken about this a little bit before, but I just want to clarify something and that is that um, there is very scant um, source material for bayonets. I picked a particularly large example incidentally and I'll explain why in a second. There's very scant evidence for these being used by themselves. There is tons and tons of evidence of them being used on the end of uh, rifles like this uh, Martini Henry uh, that this particular bayonet, this is for uh, sergeants incidentally, although sometimes it seems that a whole regiment's got these, but it's a bit of a confusing issue I won't go into in this video. But generally speaking, this was the sergeant's bayonet, the Yatagan sword bayonet. Uh, originally this was for the Enfield rifled musket incidentally but then it was later bushed so to speak uh, which means it had a, a sort of um, a band put inside to change the size of the, the muzzle ring so that it could fit on the Martini Henry's slightly smaller uh, diameter muzzle. Um, and there is obviously tons of evidence for bayonets of both the spike bayonet and knife and sword bayonets being used on rifles and muskets. Tons and tons of evidence. Uh, and as I've mentioned previously in previous videos, um, a lot of people who are kind of gun fans, as opposed to bayonet fans or sword fans, will often go, oh, you know, all the killing was done with uh, guns and artillery and stuff like this, um, and not with bayonets. And um, statistically, there's a problem with that because we start looking into how wounds were recorded and the fact that, uh, yes, most people were probably shot or blown up, um, but nevertheless, bayonets played a very important role in um, dislodging people from positions and indeed, people who were shot were often then also bayoneted, but those people were recorded only as having been shot. Long story, <laughs> I've dealt with this partially in other videos in the past, and I'm sure I'll deal with it again in the future. But coming back to the original question, were these ever used like this, like a little sword? Well, first of all, quite clearly I've picked this example because it's completely capable of being used as a sword. It's actually a really good uh, sidearm. Now, um, ironically, Colonel Mary Mong, uh, who wrote a memoir on swords, uh, he was a French colonel, I think, of cavalry, and um, he, he, he was um, a big exponent of the Yatagan blade, and he is almost certainly one of the reasons why France in 1840 adopted a Yatagan blade for its bayonets, um, and that was then uh, updated in 1866 with the famous Chaspo bayonet, but the 1840 bayonet is almost certainly what provided the inspiration for the British 1856 Yatagan bayonet, which is what we see here. Now, the theory with the Yatagan bayonet is one of the reasons it's shaped like that is so you don't spike your hand when you're ramming down a musket. Obviously, that's irrelevant to breech loading rifles like the Martini Henry. But that's one advantage of that shape. But according to Colonel Mary Mong's um, treaties, a memoir on swords, one of the advantages of the Yatagan is it brings a forward um, curved edge to, for extra chopping potential. But because it then recurves, it keeps the point on line for thrusting. Okay, so it's a he considers it, and we'll probably deal with this in more depth in a future video. I know I'm saying that a lot this time, uh, but. Um, it is a combination cut and thrust blade and Colonel Mary Mong considered this one of the best combination cut and thrust blades around. He was a big fan of Turkish weapons in general, but particularly the Yatagan, which for anybody who doesn't know, the Yatagan is essentially a Turkish blade. It has some similar weapons from other parts of history, other parts of the world, but generally speaking, the, the French and the British bayonets that used this blade shape, it was inspired by the Ottoman or Turkish Yatagan. Right, so could you use this in one hand simply as a sword, as a short sword? Absolutely. Would it make a good one? Yes, absolutely. Okay, it's got a good grip. It's nice and ergonomic. The British one, unlike the French one, which is all brass, the British one actually has leather slabs, so it's very clearly made to be held in the hand. Has a nice little, almost like bird beak shaped pommel. There's no kind of things that stick out or are uncomfortable there. You've got a front quill on. The rear quillen is obviously a muzzle ring to go over the muzzle, um, but yeah, it's got a small and functional guard and a perfectly functional blade. It's not particularly long, it's not particularly short, it's nice and handy, you can move it around quickly. This one's actually been uh, server sharpened and has got a decent edge on it. So it is good as a hand weapon, but, and this is the point I really want to make, 
there is very very little evidence of these being used as hand weapons. There's some evidence that they're being used for chopping up wood and things like that in much the same way as the cabbage chopper was used in France by artillery um, pioneers and by gunners in fact. But um, in terms of as a weapon, now why would that be? Well, so my answer is this. Generally speaking in combat, if you're expecting close combat with the enemy, then you're going to be told to fix bayonets and you're going to be shooting and reloading with the bayonet fixed. So if you get into close combat, you're primarily there to shoot. If you suddenly need to fight with someone at point blank range, you don't have time to reload or you can't bring your muzzle to bear or um, all, of the, all of the other, or you've run out of ammunition, all of the other reasons or you're storming into a building and therefore you're just trying to take ground or storming into trenches and you're just trying to take that trench, you're not bothering about shooting, aiming and reloading, then you want to do that still with your primary weapons spear and of course it has a lot more reach. Now you're primarily stabbing, primarily thrusting, so if you're doing it on the end of the rifle you've got more leverage, more force and more reach on the end of here than if you were holding the thing in your hand. Uh, so in general combat it's better to be using your primary missile weapon, i.e. your rifle or your musket, with your hand to hand thing on the end as a contingency, as a backup, should you need it. Because you can still be loading and loading and um, shooting and still have the ability to suddenly stab. Whereas if you dismount your bayonet from the end, well, now one hand's holding a bayonet and you can't operate your rifle. So for that reason alone, um, it's, it, it, it makes far more sense to have this staying on the end of your rifle than in your hand. That being said, there is an exception, and I'm going to bring World War I into it to illustrate this point. So we know that in World War I, it was often found that rifles with bayonets on were a disadvantage in trench hand-to-hand -hand fighting, uh, quite simply because they're long. Now, trenches were often d dug in zigzags and other types of shapes so that if a shell came and shrapnel flew up the trench, it didn't take out everybody standing in a straight line because shrapnel tends to fly in a straight line, as do bullets. Um, obviously, they have an arc to them, they have a trajectory to them, but they tend to fly in a straight line like this. So, for that reason, if you're jumping into a trench and fighting lots of people at very close range, actually having a long rifle with a bayonet on the end can become a disadvantage. It's like trying to use a spear inside a confined space. If I was trying to fight in this room, I wouldn't pick a spear as my preferred weapon. Um, in fact, something as small as a knife might be a preferred weapon, and that's exactly what the preferred weapons in World War I were. So there were two things which became very prominent in trench fighting in World War I, apart from hand grenades, which were super popular and super effective. But hand grenades aside, um, as far as hand weapons are concerned, knives, or daggers, same thing, um, knives and trench clubs, okay? Now, trench clubs were generally short. They weren't like you know, big long maces or baseball bats, they were generally short things, a bit like a truncheon, usually with some added weight or spikes on the end, a bit like a hammer really, um, and or knives. Um, and in that capacity, indeed we know that bayonets were used in the hand like a big knife. So, generally speaking, I think the reason we don't have any, I mean I primarily uh, research 19th century sources, so I'm mostly talking about 19th century sources here, and I think the main reason that we don't see bayonets used in hands um, in 19th century sources is because in most warfare it's more advantageous to stick your bayonet on the end of your rifle or musket and keep it there, okay? However, in trench warfare, in fighting in built up areas, in, in buildings and stuff like this, maybe in tunnels. We know that in, in tunnels, there were during sieges, there were often tunneling and counter tunneling. Um, and in those situations, pistols and knives and things like this were the preferred weapons. So, absolutely, uh, we know that these were used in the hand in trench warfare in World War I. There, the written source examples of them being used in the hand in the 19th century are scant. They might be out there, but I don't have any to hand. I don't recall any off the top of my head, and I don't know where to find any sources for those very easily. If you do know of any, please you know, post the links below. I'd be really interested to see those. But just really to say that by and large in normal warfare, this is better attached to your rifle or musket. However, in very specific scenarios, indeed, these might become more handy as a short sword or a knife. And in those scenarios, indeed, 
I, as I've mentioned in previous situations, and we know that the Gurkhas sometimes did this when they were using their cookeries, you take your long arm or your musket or your rifle, whatever you want to call it, in your left hand, and you can either hold that out of the way, we know it was sometimes just held back and held out of the way while the, the hand weapon was used a bit like a sabre, or you could use it as a parrying device um, against the other person. For example, if the other person's got a bayonet attached and you happen to have this in your hand, for some reason it's not attached, you can say it's a cookery and you can't attach it, it's not a bayonet, you can parry the uh, opposing bayonet either left or right and come in and use your uh, hand weapon. So. There we go. I hope that's a relatively efficient and brief overview of why bayonets are usually attached to the end of rifles rather than the hand. Uh, but however, sometimes they are detached and they are better in the hand and they can be used in the hand. And the last thing, the absolute last thing I'll say on this is that with modern rifles, if we're talking about modern warfare, I would argue that if we're talking about something like the M4 or the SA80, um, so we're talking about carbines already, they're not really long, they're not full length battle rifles anymore, they're carbines. They're very light, they're very short, and especially if you've got a bullpup arrangement like the SA80, you have so little reach in front of your hands with these types of rifles that in those scenarios you might find you have more reach holding a knife in the hand. And so I would argue that in modern training, and I have spoken to this, I have spoken with many people in uh, armed forces actually, and we have uh, discussed this very topic, um, and we might look at putting together some training stuff in the future. I do think if you've got something like an M4 or a um, SA80, there is some argument, if you know that you're gonna be getting into close combat, for keeping the bayonet or the knife in the hand and using the rifle in the left hand as a parrying device. But obviously, most of the time you're gonna be shooting. So if you're gonna be shooting, you need both hands on the rifle to shoot, and therefore it's better to keep the bayonet attached. So there's both sides of that argument. Anyway, I hope that's been somewhat interesting, and I'll see you for the next video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like, and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.